hands off another earth and um, it's it's the message that everyone gets uh, what are the what are the downsides of your it's all negative 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 which is disheartening of course for us and so in the, the press conference that I was involved with uh, uh, with Herman uh, with Paul yesterday um, I thought, you know, this would be an opportunity to, to talk a little bit about the, the, uh, the positivity, the necessity. So I resurrected uh, the good old napkin diagram. So this was uh, John Shepard's napkin. Well, this is not John Shepard's napkin. This is the napkin that I drew up, trying to pretend that we're back in 2010 when John talked about it. And essentially, well, you know what this is about, business as usual, um, uh, emissions reduction, we need to do that step number one, carbon dioxide removal, removal, we need to do that step number two. That leaves this bump, and that's the solar radiation management or albedo enhancement, step number three. And we need to do all three of them. And yet, as keeps on being, ah, the people we, we see today and yesterday and the day before, they say, oh, that's all very well. But we, we mustn't take our eye off the ball. Uh, we've got to make, we've got to do emissions reduction. First, let's, let's make sure we do that properly. And then we can start thinking about the other things that can happen. And, um, you know, well, I'm preaching to the choir here. It's frustrating that even very clever people are, as far as I can tell, completely uh, missing the point that emissions reductions alone are in, in, insufficient. And I think um, everybody here will agree that that, that is a battle we're fighting. And all these people are sitting around here, I would reckon uh, that we are pretty much any of them. Firstly, have they heard of your engineering? Probably most of them haven't. And secondly, uh, uh, if they have heard of it, they'll say, oh no, we shouldn't be able to think that. That's my guess. We're, we're a small voice in this. In this. That's my kind of perception. And we are, we are of course, in a, um, uh, a petro state. Um, some of us went out for dinner last night and we were very pleased to discover that our bill had been paid. Who buy? Oh, there's some uh, gas from Guy who just said, oh, look, I'll pay you bill, don't worry. That's where we are. Right. Uh, okay. Thank you. Good yeah. Well, uh, well, people will have a chance to give you feedback uh, later in the program whether that was great or uh, so right. felt no way to I'm just going to make sure that um, I'm just doing a bit of tech here, making sure there are no people admitted. Okay. Right here. Right here. Uh, let me let me call up. Uh, from Let's from use the, the seat for the yes yeah. from the back benchers. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Charles. Charles, uh, I will just introduce, I've gotten to know Charles online until this uh, past 10 days when I've gotten to know him in person. He is a co-founder with his partner of the Climate Emergency Forum, which has sponsored many of these uh, meetings and press conferences and panels over the past 10 days. And Charles, your thoughts? Thank you, for Yes, and, uh, and thank you, Herb, for participating with us here at Woodcock because uh, you've uh, filled in a very useful function. We're at the Climate Emergency Forum, and we've put on press conferences, and also this COP, we've been doing a lot of interviews, which uh, Paul is the main interviewer, and so we've got quite a few interviews to put up on our channel. We've put up three so far, and there's many more to come. Uh, as well as three press conferences which Herb has hosted. And uh, those will be coming uh, in the next few weeks. We'll be publishing all that content that we've done. But uh, none of us, in terms of uh, people that we've badged, uh, we're all badged to the ISCP. And none of this would happen without my wife here. Heidi, can you come up here? Because she's really the, the boss. She's the, the manager behind all of this. And so I'll let you speak, Heidi. Hello, everyone. And uh, I just want to say I'm very happy that Herb was able to uh, make it to COP this year. We tried to get him last year, but it didn't work out. Uh, so basically, I'm a uh, co-producer of the Climate Emergency Forum. I'm also the designated contact for the International Society for Ecological Economics. 
it is in that capacity that I'm able to provide badges for people to come to COP to access the blue zone. And I also help organize uh, press conferences that will be put on and also uh, contact people that will be able to interview. And I help produce videos on Charles. And uh, one of the things we did this year on our day off was actually go on a day trip and we went to a city called Duba and that was arranged by one of our colleagues called John Lee and that was about an hour and a half north of here and we saw the mountains and we went out for quite uh, elaborate, luxurious lunch and uh, we were gone most of the day till, till dark. It was quite cold, there was a bit of snow but there were also a lot of uh, fall colors. Uh, and if you were familiar with autumn colors, it was mostly the, the yellow that we saw, the amber colors. Um, uh, yeah, the region, you know, we've learned that the region is very well known for its what we call viticulture. And we do have an expert with us here on, on wine, so he probably can speak to a lot of that, and he'll be coming up soon here. And also we learned about, in that particular town, there's a, a settlement there, the, the Mountain Jews. That's right. We, we went, went to, to their museum. And also we met an interesting, uh, it was a young man we met for the past few days. He was a youth delegate from Turkey, so he explained to us the close uh, alliance relationship that Azerbaijan has with Turkey and how similar their languages are. So that was quite interesting. Yes, many uh, many Azerbaijanis can understand Turkish because uh, Turkey has a big uh, TV uh, entertainment uh, business and many of the Azerbaijanis watch Turkish TV. But uh, the reverse is not always true. Uh, uh, in Azerbaijani, they have a slight, they kind of have a different dialect of the Turkish language. So when they're speaking, it's not as easy for a Turkish person to understand them. But uh, basically, here in Baku, we definitely have a, an Eastern European feel, but there's also a Middle Eastern feel, and of course, uh, a bit of a Slavic or Soviet feel. Yes. Yeah, most of the residents know uh, Azerbaijani. Uh, but they also know Russian, and many of them know English as well. Now it turns out that our host at our lodging, she uh, knows French, and it turns out that uh, that's how we communicate with her, because Heidi and I both speak French. She's from uh, La Belle Province, as they say in Canada. Which is Quebec. Yes. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> guys. Thank you. All right. All right. You've got a little bit of the, of the local flavor. Um, I, I just have to say, uh, you know, uh, as some of you may know, for until I retired, I was an urban planner for many years and decades, and I've just been amazed at this city, the uh, intensity, the density, the, the boulevards, the um, um, shops, uh, the parks, the fountains, uh, it, it, uh, maybe some of this was, was sort of put on for the, for the visitors here, but it's an incredibly vibrant, uh, active, diverse city. Uh, that certainly exceeded my expectations so far. Uh, I'm really delighted to introduce our next guest from the back bench, Nick Rees. Uh, Nick, no one knows more about cops than Nick. In fact, you could say that Nick wrote the book on cop, literally. And um, he comes to these cops, uh, I've just met him for the first time in the past 10 days or so, and spends enormous amount of your time interviewing people, mm -hmm. uh, getting a flavor of what people are saying. And so uh, there's no one really better to give us a brief kind of uh, overview of your impressions of the people you met and the events you saw this week. Thanks, Nick. Okay, yeah, it, my impression really is that this is the ninth consecutive pop-out that I've been to. And uh, at the outset, we had this sort of scandal where there was a sting of the thing with the house where they were caught trying to get sponsorship and do oil deals at the same time which you know, given they are a metro state it wasn't that surprising but it was surprising when the guy who was staying in my apartment from Nigeria was very open about the fact his minister was having multiple meetings doing different uh, fossil fuel deals on different days and they were struggling to get him to go to the meetings that were to do with climate 
and then today I interviewed the MP for Oslo from Norway and just asking him quite sort of general questions about fossil fuel phase out, you know, phase down. I don't think he actually ever saw a time when Norway would stop producing fossil fuels and he didn't seem to think that that was at all a problem and if you made it a problem you were blaming Norway. So, you know, that kind of sets this up as a, it's an oil and climate uh, conference, so copper oil. And everything that's going on here, the whole finance theme of this book, is really important, obviously, to make sure that there's a just amount of money that's given to countries that are bearing the brunt of all of this. But it is kind of also assuaging a little bit of guilt by giving a completely insufficient amount of money. So, in other respects, I think it's, it's a sort of a, a disgusting element to this whole COP process. And next year in Brazil, it will be very interesting because we're going to be in the, in the Amazon. And the Amazon, there's, you know, there's papers saying that it could collapse as a, a bio by 30 could be a, uh, if not a breakthrough, a significant advance in putting SRM uh, closer to the center of the world stage. I'm not naive enough to think it will be at the center then, but perhaps. I think it has to accelerate its pace through the peer review process to get into the IPCC, and what, therefore it has to be discussed in the UNF. Uh, so I think that, that's the, the road map. Well, of course, the, the IPCC reports won't be out till the end of the decade. <laughs> so uh, it's, um, uh, do I am hearing you say that forget about any significant progress until uh, AR7 uh, is uh, is yeah, on the books. Well, that's, that's true. And I interviewed the vice chair of the IPCC, who is dead against you in Bali, but she said it's inevitable that this this is the flow, that this is the way it's going. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's advance full speed with mm -hmm. uh, peer review if you want to get into the main body. And Hugh, I know uh, I was at a, a watching a panel. I think you were there as well. Uh, where people, where you were talking about coordinating research, or was it Sean last week? <laughs> I think maybe it was Sean. Anyway, any thoughts that you might have about the progress uh, for next year, or what we need to do collectively to um, put it on the agenda? Well, I think it's probably worth saying that the um, uh, it's probably worth saying that the the remit for the for the COP process. Governed by the remit of uh, not the IPCC, but the intergovernmental panel. Um, no, the IPCC, which isn't the same as the as the IPCC, and it means that these reports are fed into the process. Um, but I think the process, the definition of the COP process, 
is to look at uh, how do we get ourselves off the uh, emission of greenhouse gases um, to stop burning fossil fuels. To get uh, geoengineering, to get SRM into the negotiation rooms, my understanding is that that would require a change in the remit of the COPs. So I, I, I think Hugh's being modest. I think in about three or four COPs, the entire COP will be about SRM and, and Hugh will be the the chief scientist uh, organizing the COP. But I, but I think the, the, issue, the issue is that uh, it, it's going to take some very deft footwork to get anything about <coughs> SRM into the negotiation rooms, and that won't happen, I don't think, for several COPs from, from now on. And I suspect, as a result, didn't we have a kind of a straw poll the other night over over a beer? Which would be the last oh, cop? No, uh, perhaps some of you on the on the call tonight might have a view. I mean, we're clearly not ever going to get to cop 1,768. Um, if we do, then that would be remarkable. Um, uh, so just in the same way as as there was a last Mozart symphony, and there was. A, uh, you know, what will be the number of the last COP? And I feel that the abject failure of COP is to, to get us anywhere, really. Uh, people are getting fed up, and the, uh, the, the damage that we're seeing is accelerating. So I went for COP 34, um, but I don't know, you had a you You're a bit more optimistic, or a bit more. Pat I don't know whether it's optimistic or pessimistic as to which number to do. Um, that, that's right. I mean, some of us said that the cops will end when we succeed, or some of us say cops will end when no one can get to them because uh, civilization will have collapsed. Or the cop, the cops will end well, when we've lost the interest in the cops. Or we've lost interest Or in, the cops will well, end when we know we've failed. I, I, uh, there's one important thing. Let's say there hadn't been any cops at all. What would the temperature be now? What would the greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere well, be now? Right? Because I'd like to see a peer-reviewed study on that because, uh, you know, COPs haven't stopped greenhouse gas emissions, but maybe we'd be much higher temperatures and much higher levels if there had been zero COPs from day one. These are the kinds of questions that you don't hear. <laughs> but, I mean, in other words, I, these sort of broader questions. And, that, and I, you know. I have to show you um, this device here. Okay, yeah. so this is the it's CO2 level, 832 parts per million, which is really good. It's later in the uh, evening. Okay that we just... And yeah, go ahead. There, there, there's fewer people here. So this, I've been monitoring the CO2 level with an Aeronet 4 device uh, for the whole two weeks. And uh, it also gives the temperature and the relative humidity and the CO2 level. And uh, walking around the COP, I've seen uh, levels as high as about 4,500 parts per million, which is about 10 times higher than Mauna Loa, and of course, what, 13 times higher than the 280 parts per million. Um, so this is an interesting, very ironic thing, because we have negotiators here trying to negotiate, and we know that any levels over about 1,200 parts per million start to impair cognition and decision-making ability. So in the plenary rooms, which we don't have availability to go to or access, um, I'm just wondering if what the CO2 levels are there, and it's no wonder they can't come to any decision because the CO2 levels are too high. So indoor air quality needs to be a, a bigger consideration. Uh, and uh, yeah, this device is called the Aeronet 4. Next COP, I have to, I'll have to attend with a methane monitor and with a, um, particle count monitor and my CO2 monitor and maybe Hughes uh, air ionizer. Okay. Um, yeah. Maybe, so. maybe we should have it outdoors next time. Well, yeah. now is your turn. We could figure out how to get questions. Um, yeah, you have to unmute. Uh, or, unmute. Or could somebody, Nick, can you handle? Can oh, and yeah, maybe we could put it. <coughs> yeah, we could. Uh, okay. Yeah, we'll unmute, change the screen so, so that we can I see everybody. So I guess Robert Tulip has his hand up. I'm, am I allowed to say at this point, just, 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 um, just so that people know, yeah. uh, in the, the Nordic Pavilion, um, just around the corner, we're having event, an event uh, um, hosting Operatio Arctis. Um, so uh, some of us would really like to 
go there. We're, we're going to, um, I, I think maybe we've got about 15 or 20 minutes for questions. Is that all right, Herb, or is that? Well, let's see how we do. Yeah, but I think some of us might, um, might want to move on. Do them, uh, <coughs> them to think. We've got somebody to admit up there. Uh, all right, well, let's, um, how about Robert Tulip? Has a question, it looks like. Thanks, guys, for, uh, for putting this on. And uh, I'd like to just reflect on Hugh's comment on how frustrating it is that really smart people can't see the need to, uh, to cool the planet. And uh, this, what that illustrates to me is that the, uh, and the articulate voices that people said are, uh, are coming from the South, outside the, the US. And uh, so the, uh, the expectation that a cop will really need to uh, switch focus pretty quickly and, and recognise that you know, governance of geoengineering is, is really a, a critical thing. Like the way they've ignored it is just immoral. You know, it's, it's just uh, contributed to extreme weather and uh, all of the other uh, climate catastrophes. Thanks. But I'm not sure that governance is, um, is uh, well, the, this whole idea of governance, um, we had the, um, the president of the AGU, the um, American Geophysical Union, uh, on a panel this morning, and she was talking about this new uh, uh, note from the AGU on geoengineering governance. Um, and it's really uh, more of the same, that we, before we can do any research, we have to uh, uh, show how well engaged we are with the indigenous people in the Arctic and we have to show how well engaged we are with, uh, with public opinion and, um, and it all has to be done responsibly and ethically and, um, and of course the, um, the, the underlying uh, principle about all this is that, that, that governance is not about uh, um, a, a willingness to move something forward if, if I'm the governor of a school, I, I'm not. It isn't my job to make to, to close the school down. If I'm the governor of a school. It's my job to make the school run as uh, smoothly and effectively as possible <coughs> to facilitate the, the, the operation. So I, 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 I'm with you, Robert. You know, we've got to get the governance. We've got to really get that working. But I really fear that in the environment we're in. It's, it's not working. I don't think it will yeah, work. The, the benefits so far outweigh the risks, but uh, I think that that debate's going to switch pretty quickly for myself. Uh, I agree, and fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, Mike McCracken, Mike, where are you?